And I'm quite sure that the Arab coalition would not have gone. The coalition would have ruptured, and the only people that would have gone would have been the United Kingdom and the United States of America. And oh, by the way, I think we'd still be there. We'd be like a dinosaur in a tar pit. We could not have gotten out, and we'd still be the occupying power, and we'd be paying 100% of all the costs to administer all of Iraq. The conflict cost 240 coalition lives, 24 of them British. Stopping the war allowed a third of Saddam's forces to escape. But Iraq had been broken as a military power, and the coalition occupied a great swathe of southern Iraq. The Allies judged Saddam Hussein would now be toppled in a palace coup. Instead, another more terrible and more desperate war was about to begin. In the Iraqi cities close to the Allied front lines, Saddam's rule had collapsed. Ordinary people took up arms against a regime they hated. These pictures were filmed in Karbala, but the scene was repeated throughout southern Iraq. The rebels were predominantly Shia Muslims. They formed the bulk of the population in that part of Iraq. Again and again, President Bush had called for uprisings. Now, hours after the war's end, he did so again. I've always said that the Iraqi people should put him aside. I want to see a, a, an end. You mentioned World War II. There was, a, there was a definitive end to that conflict. And now we have Saddam Hussein still there. In Iraq's second city, soldiers who had fled from Kuwait joined the rebels. It wasn't organized opposition. People just rebelled against oppression, cruelty and starvation, against the executions and detentions. There was very cruel injustice and people rose up to overthrow this regime. We did not think, uh, the president nor any of us thought at that time that Saddam would, uh, would continue in power, having suffered such a, uh, such a resounding defeat. With victory achieved, the political concentration that had brought such success now seemed to desert the White House team. Norman Schwarzkopf was left to cement the details of the ceasefire with the Iraqis. I had no instructions whatsoever. So lacking any, and based upon the conversations Cole and I had had, I, I, I called my stenographer in and dictated my own terms of reference, and then I called up Cole and said, I'm going to send these to you, you know, if, if, if you all approve, then send them back to me, and this is what I'll do. The Pentagon changed happy to glad we to they and put in a few fixes, gave it to the State Department, the State Department uh, changed a couple of words and sent it back to us and says, use this. Schwarzkopf decided that the talks be held in coalition-occupied Iraq, near the town of Safwan. The Iraqi leadership wanted a deal that would return their captured territory and, above all, allow them to crush the rebellions without fear of Allied troops intervening. Schwarzkopf's objectives were simpler. I went to Safwan with my own instructions, which basically, number one, was to get our POWs back, and then number two, to make sure that we had very, very clear lines drawn so that we didn't have any inadvertent battles after that. A pair of Apache gunships hovered over the Iraqi convoy. Just hours before, Saddam had personally briefed the Iraqi generals arriving to meet Schwarzkopf. Saddam wanted to consolidate the ceasefire in any way he could and he ordered his officers to give any information they had about the minefields and the prisoners of war. He didn't want to give the West any excuse to resume fighting. He wanted to sign a ceasefire agreement at any price.
Accompanied by the Saudi commander-in-chief, Schwarzkopf led the defeated Iraqi generals to the tent where the meeting would be held. Once the talks got underway, Schwarzkopf got everything he wanted. But so did the Iraqis. What they were most concerned about was that this was going to be a permanent border. And, and over and over again, they kept saying, is this a permanent border or is this just temporary? And I kept having to reassure them that, no, this is not a permanent border. This is a temporary demarcation line between our forces. And then this fellow looked at me and said, well, can we fly our helicopters? And I knew the great devastation we had inflicted upon their roads and their bridges. And that seemed like a very reasonable request to me. General Sultan Hashim Ahmad was a top official in the defense ministry. His colleague, General Salah Abud Mahmoud, had commanded the Iraqi forces in Kuwait. The two generals had achieved the objectives Saddam Hussein had set for them. Above all, the Iraqi armed forces could operate freely within their territory. And though Iraq's fighter planes were forbidden to fly, its helicopters weren't. Saddam had the tools he needed for survival. They should have surrendered their equipment, the lot. When you're dealing with a dictator, he has got not only to be defeated, well and truly, but he's got to be seen to be defeated by his own people. So that they identify the privations they've had to go through with his actions. And we didn't do that. Saddam Hussein now moved forces loyal to him from Baghdad to suppress the uprising. American troops could see the fighting from their positions, but they were ordered not to intervene. My advice to the president throughout the period of this uprising is that this did not seem to me to be an operation that we, uh, we needed to get, uh, get involved in because I couldn't figure out who was doing what to whom. And it would have required us to move further into Iraq and take responsibility for that part of Iraq and for a purpose that was not stated. And that was the quagmire. Therein laid Vietnam as far as we were concerned because we would still be there. And what's more, given the American way of doing things, we would have then had the responsibility for rebuilding all of the infrastructure. And we were just determined not to get sucked into that trap. Inside Iraq, as each rebel village and town fell, there were terrible reprisals. Some estimates put the dead in the tens of thousands.